All right, guys. Well, well thank you very much for uh, the invitation to come out here, and, and also thank you very much for coming and listening to a, you know, a topic that is usually kind of outside of your wheelhouse at 7 a.m. on a Wednesday. Um, so today we're going to be discussing the functional mapping of the androgen receptor. Um, as Peter very kindly introduced me, uh, I recently joined the Prostate Center pro uh, two years ago after spending about five years in Turkey in Istanbul right here. Um, and my lab, like you probably guessed by where I'm working, is focused on prostate cancer research. And if there's one truism, if there's one fact that is kind of universal in prostate cancer biology, it's that the androgen receptor is essential for the growth and the proliferation of the disease. Right? I mean, we've known this for 70 plus years. There's been a Nobel Prize for over 50 years on this. But yet, despite the fact that we, we know that the androgen receptor is important, we know that it's required for the growth of the disease, I don't think we honestly know why it's important. I don't think we know the nuts and bolts and understanding the function of the androgen receptor, what genes it regulates, how it regulates it. And to me, these are really important things because if we don't really understand how something works, there's no way we can better treat it. There's no way we can better inhibit it. There's no way we can better understand it. So <laughs> while we may not know why it's important, there are several facts that we've kind of accumulated over the years, and this is kind of the refresher for anybody who gets grilled on androgen receptor biology. Um, they are the transcription factor. Transcription factors are proteins that generally act as molecular rheostats. They change the expression, they turn things up, they turn things down. The androgen receptor will induce the expression of a few hundred genes. It will also downregulate or, down, or um, decrease the expression of an equal number of genes, though nobody really knows why. Um, the general mechanism of action is pretty well characterized, at least at the, the 10,000 foot view. Uh, you have androgens that translocate into the cell, or sorry, that, that passively diffuse into the cell. They bind onto an androgen receptor. Uh, the androgen receptor undergoes an allosteric modification, which then causes dimerization. And then the androgen receptor goes from the cytoplasm to the nucleus, where it binds to DNA at these androgen receptor binding sites right here. So you can't see it. So I would argue that this top part right here, that activation pathway is pretty well characterized. We understand how the AR binds to DHT really well. We understand how it moves from the cytoplasm to the DNA really well. But that bottom part where the AR goes and binds to the DNA and then induces transcription, I would say is a black box. And we make a lot of assumptions about the biology of how it works, even though there's some really fundamental characteristics of the energy receptor that we really don't know. So, for years, there was a basic model where we believed that the androgen receptor would have a promoter on the AR regulated genes. So there'd be some sort of gene X near transcription start site. The promoter would contain a 15 base pair uh, sequence called an androgen response element. And the AR would bind directly to this promoter, just like in bacteria, and drive transcription. But this is not the case. With the development of kind of novel techniques and new approaches, we began to understand that. You know, the air doesn't work like this at all. The air doesn't bind to promoters. The, the, the air doesn't really bind to response elements either. So with new approaches, things like CHIP-seq or chromatin immunoprecipitation sequencing, this is a way that you can determine where a particular protein binds to in the DNA. And you find kind of very accurately the regions where the particular AR is bound. And when you did this, when you looked at the AR with CHIP-CHIP and then chip or sequencing finally, you found that, that the vast majority of antigen receptor binding sites, over 95% of the binding sites, we're not anywhere near a promoter. They were intergenic, they were intronic. <laughs> and that's because the AR doesn't work on promoters. The AR doesn't induce transcription by binding to promoters. What it does is it binds to enhancers. Now, enhancers are uh, a genetic regulatory element that induce expression. They make expression go higher. And, and this is the refresher for the grade 12 biology. I'm sure you guys all know this, but just in case. Um, so you can have a gene and a promoter, and, but in a eukaryotic system, in a human system, that, that has very low transcription. You almost get none of it being made. Um, in contrast, though, if there's an additional element, an enhancer, that enhancer can then amplify the signal from the promoter. The RNA pole 2 doesn't get paused, and you get very high transcription of it. So the AR works by binding to these enhancer regulatory elements and driving transcription, not promoters. But one thing to keep in mind is that the end or the, the, the genome is not a two-dimensional space. So enhancers have the unique ability to interact with promoters at very long distance. There's some very famous examples where they can be over a megabase away, they can be a million base pairs away, but still directly influence activity. And because of that, because of that flexibility and that chromatin looping that occurs, 
If an enhancer is in close physical proximity to a promoter, because it loops onto the promoter, because it actually has two pieces strands of DNA that come together, it can be located five prime, it can be located three prime, it can be intragenic, it can be anywhere. Enhancers do not physically have to be beside promoters like, um, uh, like a transcription start site or a promoter itself. And what that means is that it's very difficult to identify an enhancer. You don't know where it is. It could be a million base pairs away and then interact with the gene that's on right, right beside it or even further away. Um, so the, the orientation of enhancers is not particularly important. It can be found anywhere and the identification of an enhancer or the identification of the gene that the enhancer regulates is not trivial because you get this looping event that occurs whereby you can have these very long distances of, uh, of the primary sequence but something like cohesion will come in around there and through a loop extrusion model will force out the DNA and still bringing the enhancer and promoter in very close contact to each other even though they may be very far away on the primary sequence. So, there's several approaches to quantify this, to look at the enhancer protein interactions. Um, through these new approaches, we can then begin to identify these chromosome cap confirmation capture methods. What these do is essentially kind of determine the loops. They determine the loop frequency. How close is one particular kind of region of DNA to another piece of DNA? And with that, you can get the physical proximity and then the enhancer promoter contacts. And, and this is actually quite important. This is not just an academic exercise because the, these loops, the, these contacts, and these enhancers really are critical for the function of transcription. They're critical for the expression of a lot of es essential genes. There's a classical example right here of the SHH uh, gene, which is involved in limb development. And then it's enhancer, ZRS, which is almost a million base pairs away. And if you have a single point mutation to this, or if you have loss of it, you have dramatic differences in the formation of digits. Uh, in the world of prostate cancer, you can find that enhancer duplication in, in, uh, for the androgen receptor is one of the most common mechanisms of, of AR overamplification in CRPC. So th these enhancers are really critical. These enhancers dramatically increase the signal and drive the transcription of something. Another take-home message, one thing to remember, one thing to kind of keep in mind is that the androgen receptor does not work by itself. The AR does not directly induce gene transcription by itself. It may bind to these enhancers, but what it really does when it binds is that it begins to recruit various co-activators. It brings in co-regulatory proteins that are needed for transcription to happen. It brings all the helpers together to make the transcription occur. So you get AR binding to an enhancer, and then you get a recruitment of various kind of co-regulatory proteins, like things like BRD4, P300, or different co-activators. And then this entire complex itself is what drives transcription. It's the group of proteins that come together that kind of can activate the transcriptional machinery, can induce those cohesive mediated loops. And through those complexes, you get the, the, the transcription. So the AR does not directly gene or induce gene transcription. It acts as a recruiter. It brings all the parts together to kind of cause transcription to occur. So our, our current model, our current understanding of AR enhancer activity um, is that there's several characteristics associated with AR enhancers. You, you have the AR bound to DNA. Um, you have the formation uh, of bidirectional RNA, so short little transcripts of it, they're called enhancer RNA. They make maybe about 150 base pairs in both directions. Um, there's different hi or histone modifications, specifically the accumulation of H3K27 acetylation nearby the gene. Um, and you also see things like POL2 nearby it in a physical proximity. So this is our general working model of what enhancers look like, how the AR actually kind of drives transcription. but. There is a giant fly in the ointment here. There's a big flaw that nobody ever thinks about, but it's actually pretty critical. So when we have the development of things like ChIP-seq, we can then determine how many androgen receptor binding sites are. We can see where the androgen receptor binds to in the genome. And what you see is that there are tens of thousands of androgen receptor binding sites. There's a huge number of androgen receptor binding sites all throughout the genome. But the androgen receptor only induces the expression of a few hundred genes. So how do you have this difference? How do you have you know, nearly 100 times more binding sites than genes that are being differentially expressed? Well, what are these regions doing? Is there simply noise? Do these AR kind of binding sites have no function? Or are they all kind of contributing together and kind of helping the signal work? But as we said before, I mean, the identification of these enhancers is not a trivial thing. I mean, the identification of it in conventional approaches with an enhancer identification is incredibly imprecise. So like I said, there's features that correlate with enhancer activity. There's things like the H3K27 acetylation, H3K4 monomethylation, RNA-Pol2, 
But these are not actually functional readouts. These are kind of features that correlate with enhancers. These are features that, that can be used to give a global perspective of what's going on, but not a locus-specific, not a gene-specific example. Uh, because at the end of the day, these are descriptive techniques, right? You're looking for correlation, you're not looking for causation here. The gold standard, the, the way that we functionally test enhancers is kind of a, a classical episomal reporter <coughs> assay. Uh, I'm sure some people in this room have probably done one of these in their lifetime. And how we test for uh, enhancer activity is that you have a reporter gene, you have a luciferase right here. And then beside it, there's a minimal promoter that by itself will not actually cause very high transcription. And then a region that you want to test to see if it's an enhancer. If that thing truly is an enhancer, if that thing truly drives the transcription, it will loop over, interact with that minimal promoter, and then drive the expression of the luciferase gene, or whatever reporter you want to have in there. Uh, and you can quantify this with luminescence. So this is the way that you can functionally prove whether something truly is an enhancer, whether it really is driven by the AR if you do a plus or minus androgens. But it's slow, right? You have to go one region at a time. You have to clone one site at a time and determine what's going on. And that's not really applicable for the androgen receptor because there's tens of thousands of binding sites. How, how do you do this in a high throughput way? How can you increase the number of enhancers you test uh, in one go. Uh, and there's several different approaches uh, of so-called massively multiparalleled enhancer assay. This one is my personal favorite. It's called StarSeq. It's based on the same idea as a luciferase assay, but it's slightly modified in that because an enhancer can be located anywhere, five prime, three prime, it doesn't really matter, you can clone a region of DNA downstream of a promoter and when it's transcribed, you will actually transcribe part of the enhancer itself. Because the enhancer will loop over to a minimal promoter and drive transcription, and the enhancer will be transcribed as part of the mRNA that comes out of that. And what that means is that by counting the frequency of that enhancer, by counting how often that enhancer comes up, you can infer whether it's an active or inactive enhancer. So if there's low transcription, you're going to get very low or little uh, copies of that particular genomic region. If there's a high transcription and high enhancer activity, you're going to see a lot of copies of it. And by taking that mRNA that comes out of it, and simply by sequencing it in bulk sequencing uh, with next-gen sequencing, uh, you can essentially determine in a massively multiparalleled way what is an enhancer and what is not an enhancer. And this can be done in either genome-wide screens or focus screens. So our lab, looking at this, decided, you know, could we use this for androgen receptor biology? Could we determine if these tens of thousands of binding sites are working in a cooperative fashion and kind of all having a little bit of enhancer activity that contributes to transcription, or if there was a single dominant enhancer that kind of took over the, the, the entire show and drove transcription. Um, to set up this methodology was a brutal process, but we eventually kind of worked out the kinks of it. There were several flaws with the original kind of plasmids, and we had to move over into a different system. There was a kind of a number of things we had to look at. But the single biggest factor to get the star seek to work in androgen receptor biology, because nobody's done this before, um, was to kind of make sure that you had a large enough insert size. Because these are kind of cloned plasmids, you have to get over a certain threshold in order to quantify the enhancer activity. Little pieces of DNA did not work. So if we took a, a really well-characterized enhancer right here, this is the ARE3, that's the, the enhancer for PSA. Um, if you take it as a 500 base pair chunk, you get activity. The AR is an active enhancer on this. If you start kind of moving it down and starting to cut into smaller and smaller pieces, you lose that activity. And what that meant is that our approach to do the StarSeq screen for AR was a little bit kind of complicated in that we couldn't simply synthesize it. We couldn't chemically make the pieces of DNA we wanted because that was beyond the limit of synthesis. So to make this and to test this, our, our general workflow was, was pretty straightforward. We took normal genomic DNA, we fragmented it, making sure that the region sizes were quite large, um, well over 500 base pairs. Uh, we then designed a custom capture against uh, high confidence clinical androgen receptor binding sites, um, known enhancers as a positive control, and then also genomic regions that had an ARE motif, a, a perfect ARE motif, but they didn't have AR binding. Uh, with that capture, then we cloned them into that StarSeq library. Uh, we got great representation, so for each of the sites we were interested in, we got approximately 50 fragments per region, so there's a lot of duplication built into it. You can get a lot of confidence about your signal. Uh, and then with that system, taking that plasmid, we put them into uh, LNCAP cells, uh, 
and then look for their activity against uh, ethanol or DHT. Okay? All right. So, first of all, we got great reproducibility. The signal to noise was very good. Uh, between the biological replicas, we, we saw an excellent signal, and it was kind of consistent throughout. Um, at no and AR enhancers, we saw a dramatic increase in, in the star seek signal. In the top panel right here, this is an FKPV5. Um, you can see that it matches really well with the, the chip seek tracks. Um, and what's great is that when you compare the results from star seek to a luciferase assay to a conventional episomal assay, there's a good correlation between the two of them. So this kind of massively high throughput way represents kind of the same result you would get if you went one plasmid at a time. So you can identify AR enhancers quite accurately with SARSEQ. When we looked at the 4,000 odd binding sites, we found that only antigen receptor binding sites had AR mediated enhancer activity. Um, sites that contained the ARE motif, which is quite interesting to me, we had 2,800 sites that had an ARE motif. Uh, only two of them were active, suggesting that you know, that piece of DNA is not enough to be an active enhancer. Having a motif, having that AR binding site is not enough. Um, and then the non-AR enhancers obviously didn't have any activity. So when we dug into it, when we started to take a look at the AR enhancers and at these antigen receptor binding sites, we, we identified three flavors of AR enhancers. There was inactive, whereby there was no enhancer activity in the absence of the antigen receptor or with the antigen receptor. There was induced, where you went from low levels of androgen to very high levels of enhancer activity with the antigen receptor. And there were constitutionally active, which were active in both cases regardless of whether the antigen receptor was there or not. So if you actually look at the numbers for this, if you actually look at these androgen receptor binding sites, what was fascinating to me is that the vast majority of them are inactive. The vast majority of androgen receptor binding sites are not enhancers. They have no function. They have no activity at all. You can see the inactive sites right here in the StarSeq track. And then you can compare it against AR ChIP-seq or Pol2 or H3K27 acetylation. And you see the general trend. So you see that Pol2 goes up in the inducible one, it goes up in H3K27 acetylation, and you get that bidirectional eRNA being made in the uh, inducible ones as well. But the actual distribution of them is vastly towards inactive sites. The antigen receptor is not working as an enhancer at most of the binding sites where it goes to. Uh, <coughs> And this work was all done in cell lines, but the results that we have in here generally correlate pretty well with the clinical samples as well. So taking a look at a published set of clinical uh, CHIP-seq from primary prostate cancer, uh, we see that the regions that we annotated as inducible or constitutionally active tended to have much higher uh, histone marks associated with enhancers. They had much higher H3K27 acetylation, suggesting that the annotations were, were, were accurate. But the real killer for me, the one that gave me a lot of confidence with this in vitro assay um, correlating to the, the kind of real world, uh, was some data we just got from the, the DARINA trial. Uh, this is a population of a, a neoadjuvant enzalutamide trial whereby uh, high-risk patients um, are given ENZA for three months before surgery. But what's great about it for me is that there was CHIP-seq done from the biopsy before the ENZA treatment, and there was CHIP-seq done after the radical prostatectomy. So what that means is that you have two samples here. You have a sample whereby there's a functional antigen receptor in the beginning and a sample where the antigen receptor is not functional at the end of it. So this is the same thing largely as what I do in a Petri dish in a clinical setting. And to my great surprise, the correlation is spot on. It is absolutely perfect. Constitutionally active enhancers are active with ENZA or without ENZA, makes no different. Um, inducible ones go down dramatically with the presence of enzalutamide. Uh, and then the inactive ones stay inactive regardless. And this is going off the H3K27 acetylation chip seek. Um, so the, the signals that we see with the star seek assay correlate really well to the clinical outcome. And I think it gives us a little bit more confidence in the results of it. The obvious question comes up then why bother doing uh, the star seek? If you can get enough of a signal from H3K27 acetylation, you should be fine. You just take this and run, right? That this should be enough to work with. And this is the fundamental problem is that H3K27 acetylation, that histone mark, it, it's descriptive. It correlates, but it doesn't cause, right? I mean, it's not a functional readout. You're just saying that this mark has, uh, or this region has a histone mark that we associate with enhancers, but it doesn't actually prove that it really is an enhancer. And the challenge with that is that H3K27 acetylation is a pretty broad peak. So if you take a look at a site that is inactive, 
right? If you take a look at a region where there is no enhancer activity that we can measure with StarSeq right here, you can see that there's quite a few sites that have high HPK27 acetylation. They have a very high signal um, that, that's being induced. <coughs> now, on average, the, the, the inducible ones, the things that we call as active enhancers based on the StarSeq, do generally have higher signal on average, but when you actually start going at specific locuses, when you start looking at specific enhancers and specific genetic or elements, HPK27 acetylation is not enough. If you just took AR and HPK27 acetylation, you'd have an approximately 80% false positive rate. And to demonstrate this, we, we took two sites, right? We took the regions here, which have very high HPK27 acetylation, but no star seek signal. And these regions right here, which have a high star seek signal, but no HPK27 acetylation. And we tested them with a conventional luciferase assay. So these guys are both very uh, Met, or sorry, uh, acetylated, they would have been called as active enhancers if you simply looked at the, the chip seek tra <coughs> tracks. But when you actually go down and you measure the activity, when you do the actual functional characterization of this, um, you can see that it's only the, the values that have uh, the star seek signal that are actually really enhancers. Just because you have high chip seek, just because you have high HPK27 acetylation, that does not mean that you are an active enhancer. So, <coughs> the question then comes up is, is how do these things all come together? How is it that you have so few inducible conventional uh, AR enhancers um, and what role do they play in gene transcription? So the first thing we needed to figure out was, was how the AR bound. Because there's vastly more AR binding sites, there's typically multiple AR site or binding sites nearby a, a gene. So you can have kind of maybe two antigen receptor binding sites or three or four nearby a gene. So the question then came up is, is the difference we're seeing a selective binding? Is the AR only binding to one of the sites or the other sites to kind of induce transcription? Is it working like a sync? Are you getting a selective binding phenotype or is it kind of a co-binding where the AR will bind to multiple sites simultaneously and you get kind of the protein uh, being found nearby a gene uh, at the same time? Uh, to characterize this, we, we did uh, or a single cell attack seek because there's some features that are associated with active enhancers where they, they, they open up the chromatin a little bit. So when we do this for the L and cap cells, we generally can score them um, being co-occupancy. We see that, that most of the active enhancers tend to have multiple binding sites nearby them. So they're not binding one at a time. It's not one ARBS site or another one. They're, they're typically binding all at the same time. So you're seeing kind of a co-occupancy occurring. So with that, then we went on to look at the gene expression data. So we, we tried to correlate the AR star seq plus an RNA seq of an androgen upregulated gene. So we Taking these genes, you can score it a couple different ways. We look for those that were nearby. So we were looking for kind of androgen receptor binding sites that were nearby an upregulated gene. And we found that the induced ones were far more likely to be close to an upregulated gene. We also took a look at kind of some uh, chia pet data, that chromosomal conformation capture data, so the three-dimensional proximity. And we found that, that if you look at chromosomal looping, generally the induced genes have more loops to an upregulated gene than an inactive <coughs> one or a constituently active one. So the, the gene expression does seem to correlate relatively well with the induced enhancer activity. The numbers are quite a bit lower than the theoretical limit of 100% simply because we're not testing every androgen receptor binding site. We're only testing those clinically found ones. So the data that we have suggests that the induced kind of ARBS sites are required for transcription, right? It's the induced ones. It's the kind of conventional enhancers that actually cause gene expression. But there's a little kind of hiccup to that in, in that all the androgen receptor binding sites or androgen receptor binding sites are themselves evolutionarily conserved. So there's no difference between induced, constitutionally active, and inactive ones, suggesting that, that it's not quite as simple as that. It's not as simple as kind of having only activity in the inducible ones. Potentially, the other ones may have a role as well. So to investigate this, uh, we did CRISPR-I. And CRISPR-I is a way to inactivate a, a particular genomic region. Uh, you can have your androgen receptor binding site and you can target a fusion protein of DCAS9 and CRAB. Um, this CRAB is a repressor and what it will do is kind of induce, kind of inactivate the enhancer by forming heterochromatin around the region. So you can knock out specific enhancers and then determine what role they play in transcription, right? So we can take those androgen receptor binding sites and then we can kind of start to inactivate them to see what they do. Uh, as a proof of principle, we looked at the, the uh, PSA gene, or KLK3. Uh, there's two enhancers nearby it. There's an inducible enhancer, that ARE3, that is kind of well characterized and well studied. And there's a constituently active isoform or uh, enhancer slightly upstream. Uh, 
Um, as a positive control in the assay, we also target the transcription start site because this will also, CRISPR will also inactivate that as well. So taking the system, then we can systematically dissect what uh, role each flavor of enhancer has. Uh, is it only the inducible ones that are required? Are inactive ones as well act required? Um, and we, we can kind of knock them out one by one. So when we do this and we, we try it out for the inducible ones, we, we see that the, the loss of the promoter dramatically decreases the gene expression. Uh, inactivating the inducible enhancer dramatically decreases gene expression, but also the constitutionally active one seems to have an important role in KLK3 as well. Um, and to demonstrate that it's on target because CRISPR is notoriously finicky, uh, we find that, that a non-AR regulated gene is not affected at all. So taking this approach, we've gone on and then kind of characterized an additional six regions, um, and I'm only showing data for two right now, where we, we knock out each individual flavor of enhancer one by one. So we get rid of the inducible ones, the constituent active or the inactive ones. Um, and when we do this, what we find is that generally, the inducible ones are always required. You need to have kind of a conventional AR enhancer for transcription to occur, right? And that matches the RNA-seq data, whereby you have to kind of have an active enhancer that is modulated, that is driven by the AR. But what's fascinating to me is that a lot of the inactive or constitutionally active enhancers in a gene-specific way seem to be required as well. So if you get rid of an inactive enhancer, this, this is an AR binding site that has zero enhancer activity, it still can have a dramatic impact on transcription, suggesting that there may be additional roles that we don't quite understand at these, these AR binding sites. And that the AR is not working as a simple enhancer, but actually may have additional roles in either maintaining loops or inducing phase condensates or whatever it may be. Um, to support this, there has been some evidence as well in estrogen receptor biology where they've, they've shown a very similar phenomenon whereby you can have inactive enhancers that actually kind of seem to be important for transcription. Um, giving a little bit more credence to this as well, if you take a look at the, the clinical AR chip seek, you, you can find that each individual patient has a slightly different chip seek systrome, right? The AR does not bind at the exact same site in every single patient. Um, so if you take a population of 100, you see slightly different kind of binding sites in each patient. Um, so if we, we look at where the binding sites occur, we find that the inducible ones tend to be more conserved. So um, if you're scoring the uh, homogeneity within the population, generally the induced active enhancers are more commonly found across all patients than the inactive or the constitutionally active ones. Okay. So <laughs> I'm sure you're asking yourself right now, I'm sure you are kind of tired of this and you're kind of too dry. So one kind of valid question for you is, does the AR enhancer annotation matter at all in prostate cancer? Is there any value in this beyond from the academic exercise? Now, I have a bias in this. I have kind of a vested interest in this particular area. Um, but I would argue absolutely. I would say this is critical because if, if we're going to understand how prostate cancer happens, we need to figure out the mechanism of action at the end of the day. And a fundamental truth is that most of the genome, most of the, the, the locations in prostate cancer where somatic mutations occur, happen in the non-coding space, right? Non-coding DNA represents 98% of your genome. It is the vast majority of what makes you or you. Um, but if you actually look at uh, what, what happens there, it's largely a black box. We, we don't really understand the regulatory elements in the non-coding space very well. Uh, but yet there's a fair amount of clinical evidence to say that these are important, right? This is not just simply junk DNA. There is actually function to that. So, if you look at the, the, the single nucleotide polymorphisms that are associated with a higher risk of prostate cancer, so these are the SNPs from GWAS studies, you can find that greater than 90% of them occur in non-coding space. In addition to this, we had some work recently where we demonstrated that the androgen receptor binding sites themselves are actually highly mutated. There's a high frequency of single nucleotide variants that occur at the androgen receptor binding sites, and this is only in prostate cancer. This doesn't happen in other uh, cancer types as well. So we have this kind of problem whereby the non-coding regions are important. We see a lot of mutations at the androgen receptor biology, but we're kind of overwhelmed by the number of them, right? If there's a, or 10,000 binding sites, you don't know what binding site is important. You don't have kind of a good annotation to be able to follow it forward. So taking the, the annotations, taking the StarSeq results that we have, uh, we then use this as kind of a map or to focus on specific mutations, to focus on specific non-coding mutations that we think are more likely to be important. 
So when we do this, we take these single nucleotide variants uh, at the androgen receptor binding sites and we test them. Uh, when we overlay whole genome sequencing from approximately 200 patients to the, or metastatic CRPC patients, uh, we find that we can identify a large number of mutations at these androgen receptor binding sites. But what was interesting is that when we use this star-seq uh, annotation to kind of guide our, our selection for, for uh, characterization, we find that about 20% of the SNVs we tested impact AR enhancer activity. So these mutations that are happening in the non-coding space, they have a pretty high probability of impacting transcription in some way. They have a pretty high probability of altering the AR transcriptional landscape and thus kind of helping the cancer grow and proliferate. Um, and, and the power of this approach is kind of, um, it, it dramatically increases the throughput compared to conventional approaches. We, we've also demonstrated that these somatic mutations affect gene expression in patients as well. So the way that we're using the STAR-seq for the non-coding space is to help kind of thin down the regions to test, whereby we can get thousands of mutations from the whole genome sequencing in the non-coding region. Uh, we can then kind of thin it down to hundreds of mutations based on the STAR-seq result. Um, we can then identify essential genes from either genome-wide CRISPR screens or high chip to identify the loops. And then we can find some actionable causal variants uh, from the, this eventual path. So the conclusions are we figured out a way to functionally map the AR enhancers. Um, it correlates with gene expression and uh, clinical data. Uh, what's fascinating is that very few of the antigen receptor binding sites are actually active. Very few of them have kind of conventional activity that we would associate with enhancers. Um, but they seem to be required for transcription. And, oh, we don't talk about it, but we, we have got very complicated neural networks as well. And with that, thank you. Thank you.